this is an introduction to photography and Affinity Photo version 2 editing. So let's get started on capturing and creating unforgettable moments. Well, let's look at this tutorial in two parts. Photography, well the basics of photography for beginners and using Affinity Photo version 2 to help uh, move you along and enhance your photos. Now embarking on photography as a beginner is exciting. Learn the basics of your camera settings like aperture, shutter speed and ISO to capture great shots. There's no mystery. As for post-session skills using Affinity Photo version 2, start by importing your photos and exploring the software's interface. Familiarise yourself with essential tools like cropping, adjusting exposure and enhancing colour. Dive into more advanced features like layers and masks to refine specific areas of your image. Utilise tutorials and the Affinity Photo community to expand your knowledge and skills. With practice, you'll master the art of enhancing your photos with Affinity Photo version 2. Now, absolutely, mastering aperture, shutter speed and ISO is foundational in photography. These are your three main things. Aperture, which is known as f-stop, controls the size of the lens opening, affecting depth of field. Lower f-stop values, i.g. f2.8, results in a shallow depth of field, great for portraits. Higher values, e.g. f16, yield a broader depth of field, ideal for landscapes. Shutter speed determines the duration and the shutter remains open. Faster shutter speeds freeze action, e.g. sports photography, while slower speeds create motion blur. If you're photing, photographing flowing water, bit of a tongue twister there, sorry about that. Number three is ISO. Adjusts the camera's sensitivity to light. Higher ISO values, 800 or above, are suitable for low light conditions but may introduce more noise. That's a grainy texture to your film. Mastering these settings allows you creative control over your images, enabling you to capture the scene as you envision it. Practice and experimentation are key to gaining confidence in using these elements effectively. Now let's look at some more depth here. Aperture measured in f-stops plays a crucial role in photography. Understanding it allows you to control the depth of field, introducing what's in focus within your image. DOF is the depth of field. Aperture impacts how much of your photo is in sharp focus. A wide aperture, 2.8 for example, creates a shallow depth of field, isolating the subjects from the background. This is ideal for portraits, emphasising the person while blurring the surroundings. Now the lens opening size, the f-stop number, represents the size of the aperture. A lower f-stop, e.g. 1.4, means a larger opening, allowing more light to enter the camera. Conversely, a higher f-stop, f16 for example, means a smaller opening, restricting the amount of light. So the higher the f-stop number, the smaller the opening. The lower the f-stop number, the larger the opening. Now bokeh, which is a word that's come into fashion these days, achieving a pleasing background blur, known as bokeh, is often linked to a wide aperture. This adds a visually appealing soft background to your images. In summary, mastering aperture provides you with creative control, allowing you to tailor your photos by managing the focus and background elements. Experiment with different aperture settings to understand their impact on your images. Now shutter speed is the next one. It's another critical element in photography influencing the way motion is captured in your images. Freezing or blurring motion, shutter speed determines how long the camera's shutter remains open. Faster shutter speeds, 
a thousand, one thousandth of a second, frees fast-moving objects like a sprinter in action or a bird in flight. Slower shutter speeds, e.g. one thirtieth of a second, introduce motion blur, conveying a sense of movement ideal for capturing flowing water or the intentional blur of a moving subject. Now, exposure control is shutter speed along with aperture and ISO contributes to the overall exposure of your photo. A balance among these settings is crucial to achieving a well-exposed image. Now, handheld versus tripod use. Faster shutter speeds are essential for handheld photography to avoid camera shake and blurry images. In low light or when intentionally capturing long exposure shots, a tripod becomes crucial to remain to maintain image sharpness. Now, long exposure techniques include experimenting with longer shutter speeds opens up creative possibilities, such as light trails in night photography or capturing the stars in astrophotography. In essence, mastering shutter speed allows you to control the visual representation of motion in your photographs whether freezing fast action or introducing a dynamic sense of movement. Practice with different shutter speeds to understand their impact on your shots. And you can see our image that's just come into vision here. That's obviously taken with a mixture of what you're looking at there, freezing or blurring motion, exposure control, handheld versus tripod use, and long exposure techniques. Which one do you think is most appropriately used in that photograph? Now, understanding ISO. This is the third key component in the exposure triangle, alongside aperture and shutter speed. Understanding ISO allows you to control the camera's sensitivity to light. ISO measures the sensitivity of your camera's sensor to light. A lower ISO, 100 or 200, is less sensitive and suitable for well-lit conditions, whereas a higher ISO, 800 to 1600 or more, is used in low-light situations. ISO provides a way to compensate for low-light when you cannot achieve a proper exposure with just aperture and shutter speed. However, increasing ISO comes with a trade-off, as higher ISO settings can introduce digital noise or graininess in your images. Low versus high ISO. Lower ISO values are ideal in situations with ample natural light, such as outdoor photography on a sunny day. Higher ISO values become necessary in low light environments when you need faster shutter speeds to freeze motion. Noise and image quality. One challenge with higher ISO settings is the potential for increased digital noise. Modern cameras handle higher ISOs better than older models, but it's still important to find a balance between ISO and image quality, especially in situations where noise might be distracting. Understanding how to balance ISO with aperture and shutter speed allows you to adapt to various lighting conditions while maintaining the desired image quality. Experiment with different ISO settings to find the right balance for your shooting scenarios. Now let's look at some of this in detail. Aperture stands as one of the fundamental elements in photography, forming one of the three pillars alongside shutter speed and ISO, topics covered in separate chapters of our Photography Basics Guide. Among these elements, aperture holds a significant role, and in this article we'll delve into a comprehensive exploration of aperture, unravelling its intricacies and explaining its essential functions in the realm of photography. Aperture serves as a tool to enhance the visual depth of your photographs by managing the depth of field. On one end, a wide aperture creates a captivating blurred background, producing a striking shallow focus effect, a favourite technique in portrait photography. Conversely, at the opposite extreme, a narrow aperture ensures sharpness from the immediate foreground to the distant horizon, a technique often employed by landscape photographers. 
Moreover, the aperture setting influences the overall exposure of your images, allowing you to control brightness or darkness, adding another layer of creative control to your photography. Now, shutter speed in detail. One of the trio of vital settings in photography is shutter speed, alongside aperture and ISO. Shutter speed plays a dual role. It influences the brightness of your photo and introduces dynamic effects by either freezing action or creating motion blur. In this upcoming article, we'll demystify this concept in straightforward language. Shutter speed is linked to the camera's shutter, a curtain in front of the centre that remains closed until the camera is triggered. When the camera fires, the shutter opens, allowing light to reach the centre sensor sorry, through the lens. After light collection, the shutter promptly closes, preventing further exposure. The button initiating this process is aptly named the shutter or shutter button, as it activates the shutter to open and close. Shutter speed reverse refers to the duration of the camera shutter remaining open, allowing light to reach the camera sensor. Essentially, it denotes the time your camera dedicates to capturing a photograph, and this duration significantly influences the visual outcome of your images. For instance, in instances of a prolonged shutter speed, also termed a slow shutter speed, the sensor is exposed to light for an extended period. One notable consequence of this is motion blur. When the shutter speed is prolonged, any moving subjects within the photo will exhibit a blurred appearance along the direction of their motion. This effect is frequently employed in advertising, especially in showcasing cars and motorcycles, where intentional blurring of moving wheels imparts a vivid sense of speed and motion to the viewer. Now ISO, simply put, ISO is a camera setting that adjusts the brightness of a photo. Elevating the ISO number brightens the photo progressively. This capability proves valuable in capturing images in low light conditions or offering flexibility with aperture and shutter speed settings. However, there are consequences to increasing ISO. Excessive ISO can introduce unwanted grain, known as noise, making the photo less usable. Brightening a photo through ISO always involves a trade-off. It's advisable to raise the ISO only when alternative adjustments, such as increasing shutter speed or widening the aperture, are impractical. For example, when a longer shutter speed would result in subject blurriness. Each shutter comes with its own set of ISO values. Each camera I should say, comes with its own set of ISO values, also known as ISO speeds, and a typical range includes from 100 through to up to 6400 for very high ISO. In straightforward terms, doubling your ISO speed equates to doubling the brightness of the photo. For instance, a photo at ISO 400 will be twice as bright as one at ISO 200, and ISO 200 will be twice as bright as ISO 100. Now lastly, RAW for beginners. Shooting in RAW format offers a significant advantage by preserving greater details and colours in your images. RAW files boast a heightened dynamic range, enabling the capture of a broader spectrum of light and dark shadows. Additionally, they exhibit a wide colour gamut allowing for the representation of more hues and tones. This affords photographers enhanced flexibility and control during the editing process, enabling adjustment to exposure, contrast, white balance, saturation and other settings without compromising quality or introducing artefacts. Using raw images in photography provide several advantages that can significantly impact the quality and flexibility of your final images, 
Here are some key reasons why photographers choose to shoot in RAW. Greater image quality. RAW files contain more data and preserve a higher level of detail compared to compressed formats like JPEG. This allows for better image quality, especially in terms of sharpness, color accuracy and dynamic range. And there we have increased dynamic range. RAW files typically have a higher dynamic range, capturing more details in both shadows and highlights. This is crucial when dealing with scenes with a wide range of light and dark areas. Wider color gamut. RAW files can store a wider range of colors, providing more flexibility during post-processing. This is especially beneficial for photographers who want to precise control over color correction and manipulation. Non-destructive editing. Raw editing is non-destructive, meaning you can make adjustments to exposure, contrast, white balance and other settings without permanently altering the original image data. This allows for experimentation and fine tuning without loss of image quality. And lastly, white balance control. Raw files allow for more accurate and flexible adjustment of white balance during post-processing. This is particularly useful when dealing with challenging lighting conditions. So, looking at raw processing in Affinity Photo 2.4 is our next part of this mission. Now, I'm going to keep it reasonably simple for beginners, and I'd like to start by introducing some photography terms. Now, this is not an exercise in photography, and it really is for beginners. So, if you're an experienced photographer, just skip right along to where I'm going to be looking particularly at using raw images in Affinity Photo. Now, if you haven't shot in RAW before, don't be afraid of it because it's so easy. It's nothing to be afraid of. Let's just close that down, shall we? Now, here's our Affinity Photo. It's all loaded and ready to go. And I'm using Affinity Photo 2 Beta at the moment. So it's Affinity Photo 2.4, which hasn't quite been released yet, but it'll come out in a month or two, I guess. It'll certainly come out this year. But it works exactly the same in Affinity Photo 2.3, um, well, virtually any version you've got at the moment, except perhaps version 1. If you're still using Affinity Photo version 1, you really need to upgrade. <laughs> okay, now let's just, let's just leave that there. We've got a photo there. We're not going to use that one. Will that open? No, nah, this, it will. That's Mam Tor. Now, that's up in the northern part of England, and if you haven't been up there, it's certainly a place worth visiting. Very spectacular. But what I'm going to be using particularly is, if I can find it here and get it open, to, to demonstrate this will be Affinity Photo and Apple Photos, which is the one that's open now. Now, here's a whole list of photos that I've taken and you can see if you look in the top left hand corner they're all in raw format so they're very rough some of them this is taken at the Minsmere Bird Sanctuary which is very close to where I live now some of those images are good some of them are bad some of them are pathetic and this one here particularly you might normally look at that and say oh that's overexposed what have I done wrong there but never mind, because it can be rescued, and that's what we're going to look at in this exercise. Rescuing photos. A little bit about pho photography first, and then straight into rescuing, enhancing, embellishing your photos. This is not about design and how to make other designs. This is about photography, and that's what we're going to look at. So let's get right to it, shall we? We're going to be looking at developing raw images in Affinity Photo, if I can just find it, in Affinity Photo, um, and I'm using version 2, and this is the beta one, but it doesn't matter, it works the same in yours, 
But this is Apple Photos, you can see here. And I've loaded in a raw image taken with my DMC G5. There we go. DMC G5 camera. Now this will come up in a moment when we have a look at it. But at the moment, you can't edit images. Let's open that up there. If, you're, if I do this, edit with Affinity Photo 2 Beta, you can see it comes up and it doesn't give the camera data and it also doesn't open it in raw format, which is no good to us. So what I've got to do is close that. Just take that back down for a moment. This one here, I've got to export that. And you can do that easily enough. Go up to File, Export, Unmodified Original for one photo. Don't export the modified one. You don't want anything to be done to it. It's just the original. And it's that photo. Now what it will do is, is export it to this on a and put it in a folder of your choice. That's the photo number that the camera's quite delightfully put in there. There's probably all sorts of things in there including date, but you can see it's an RW2 type file. In other words, it's a raw file, as you can see there. Raw. Now the thing we want to do with this is bring it into photo and develop that image there. You can see it's way overexposed. I don't know what I was doing there. Fiddling with a camera. The sun was in my eyes. Birds were tweeting. Birds singing in the trees. Sun shining. There we go. So let's open this in Affinity Photo. Let's bring that up. We'll go to Affinity Photo. We'll open a file. Now there it is nicely, because I did this before, obviously. There's the one we want. And let's open that file. And there we go. It's now in the develop persona. If we're ready for develop or cancel, output as a pixel layer. Yeah, we can do that. Or you can output it as a raw layer embedded or raw layer linked. Let's just leave it as a pixel layer at the moment. And you can see that's ready for development. Now the first thing I need to do, I would suspect, bring it over here, is reduce the exposure a bit. It's way overexposed. There we go. Bring the black point up a little bit. Maybe not. It's quite a bright day and the shadows are really sharp. There we go. That's sharpened up the shadows a bit. Bring up the brightness just a little bit without overexposing it. That's 10% brightness increase. Am I happy with that? Yeah, it's not too bad. Contrast, I can enhance that. Oh, that's better. Grass blades. Clarity, just a little bit of clarity, 15%. Saturation, oh, it's quite dry out there at the moment, but we can bring that up a little bit. Bring the vibrance up. Just a touch. White balance, shadows and highlights. I think I'll leave the white balance because mm, temperature. There's the grass is just a tad greener. The tint go towards the green. Slight green tint. Shadows and highlights. Shadows and highlights. Shadows. Just touch the shadows slightly and highlights. There we go. 8% on the highlights. Profiles, well, we don't need to worry about that, do we? Because that's what it is. Output profile, that's enough. Now we can develop that and that's a much better image than the original one. There we go. Develop. Job done. That's the original image. Now let's have a look at option two. Well, not option two, but another option for loading raw images into Affinity Photo. 
Now I'm using Apple Photos here, and you can see that there, Apple Photos. Now you can't just open or edit with. It just doesn't want to do it. It will it will load in a non non raw file. We want the raw file, so we've got to go up here to the right hand side to where it says edit. And you click on edit and you get all sorts of things you can edit it with, but I don't want to edit it with Apple Photos. What I want to do is go to that little circle there with the three dots, extensions, and open that. And I can mark up edit in Affinity Photo. And that's, you can see the little symbol there, that's the that's the um, beta version I'm using. So let's click on that and it opens it up in the beta version. And you can see it's in develop, it's got develop mode. It's in the develop persona. And I can cancel that and so forth. Now there's no camera data there and I don't know why that hasn't brought that camera data in because it is there. Let's close that or cancel that. Are you sure you want to cancel? Yes. Now that's an image I've just got there. Let's go back to Apple Photos right there. Cancel that. We don't want that there. Cancel. Select done. Now let's see what happens when I do this. Edit with. Affinity Photo 2 Beta. No camera data. Maybe that image hasn't got camera data in it, but it should have. But you can see it doesn't open it in raw mode. So we'll just close that one. Close, close, close all. There we go. All the images that were there are now closed. Now that's really interesting. But what we can also do if you wish, hang on a moment while I plug in the camera. I've got my camera here, ready to go. It's a bit of a fiddle to get this little little thing in. Now I'll turn the camera on. And select PC mode. There we go now. There's the camera, there's the images on the camera. And that's in there, no devices, no name. So let's go to Affinity Photo, File, Open, from no name, the DSIM, my partner, which is where they're held, and you can see they're all raw files. So we should be able to load one directly in. Open. And there you go, a nice develop it when it's ready, raw file. So that's direct from the camera, that method. The previous method was not direct from the camera, it was input from Apple Photos. which is where that, it, it's waiting for me to import them, import all new photos, you see. Now, I don't want to import all new photos, so we'll just get out of Apple Photos. I'll leave that one set there for the time being. Now, that's what there is in the Apple Photos one. The last version, Affinity Photo, I'll quit that. Cancel that. Cancel development. Affinity Photo Beta. Quit. You can see I've got a couple of spare files there. There's an Affinity Photo, a raw file. Now what I'm going to do is the same deal in... Now this is Windows 11, as you can see. Let's see if I can see the same thing in Windows 11. Now this is a little app called Image Raw, which is not what we're going to use, but it opens it up, it goes to there, 
There's no name on Mac. DSIM, iPana. And let's try the first one. Open. Takes a little moment to load it in, but there's an image, and that's in raw file. That's from, and there's all the camera data. Panasonic DMC G5, and you can do that. Now, that's nothing to do, I might add, with Affinity Photo, but at least it allows you to use that. But what we can do, if I go to Apps, All Apps, Affinity Photo Customer Beta. This is version 2.4 we're still using. You can see that there. It works just as well on the earlier versions when you're doing it this way, but I like to um, extend it to 2.4, which will be released later this year. Lots of new additions being built into it. Now, there we go. File. Open. No name, there's that one there. Now this should load it straight into Affinity Photo. It should load it straight into Affinity Photo. But what's it doing? There it is, just taking its time. There's Develop, Cancel, Output, Pixel Layer. There's all the camera data. Now, why it wasn't showing that from the one that's in Apple Photos, I don't know. But that's... Neither here nor there, really. I like to store them in Apple Photos so that you can easily work on them. Now, that's Windows 11. We can cancel that. Are you sure you want to cancel? Yes. Close that. Close that. And let's get rid of Windows. Now, if you're wondering what I did with Windows 11, Windows 11 on my system, I'm running a Mac M2 and I've got Windows 11 running in parallels and you can see it runs quite happily in parallels. Okay, now for the moment that's importing raw files. I'm trying to encourage you there to use raw photography because if nothing else, what have I done with um, what have I done with my What have I done with my, I can't even remember the name of it, Finder, there we go, open with Affinity Photo, Customer Beta, now that should bring up, there it is, bobbing away down the bottom. I've got the thing working pretty hard at the moment, so, hmm, that's taking a little bit of time. Oh, I shouldn't have closed that down, should I? Come on, guys, load up. Here we go. And there's the image back in develop mode. Just waiting for me to do neat things like reduce the overexposure on it. That could come down a bit. That was that was reasonably yeah, that's nice. That that water there is looking nice. Bring up the black points a little bit. Reduce the brightness a little bit. Enhance the contrast. Mm, not too much. Clarity, a little bit more saturation, a bit more vibrance. Highlights, shadows, white balance, temperature. Let's uh, put a bit of green in that, bring the temperature up. No, I want to drop that temperature a little bit. There we go. So, nice cold day. Let's develop that. And that's how you can turn what was ostensibly, right from the word go, a pretty daggy photograph, overexposed, but that's brought up that water in the foreground nicely now, and the, and the um, 
all the bushy area on the far bank there is in shadow, which it really was in the original thing. And I could save that, and um, that's quite a usable image. Okay, now the next thing we'll look at is some photography tips to go along with that. And last of all, I'll do the same thing on the iPad. There we go. Now there's the live documents in the raw directory. Now there's the one we were working on before. You can see it there on the second in from the second row. Let's open that one and see if it comes in as a raw file. Loading the image. And there we go. It's a raw file. You can see that in the top left hand side. Pixel layer. Now we can go to there and reduce the exposure. Now I'll sit back a little bit so you can see my face in there. But we'll adjust that one. Lower the brightness slightly, I think. Contrast again. I should have remembered those numbers, shouldn't I? Never mind, clarity, we can get a bit more clarity there. Saturation, take that up there. You can make the temperature really cold or warm the temperature up a little bit. We'll leave that pretty much where it is. But take the tint into a bit greener so that grass and stuff on the embankment there looks a bit greener. And that's all there is to that. Now that's using the iPad. Now over here on the right hand side you can see there there's the tick. Let's tick that and it will develop that image and there we go. You've now got a usable image that you can save and do what you like with. Isn't that marvelous? Go ahead. Make my day. Subscribe.